Well, let me begin with a warm welcome to all of our regular listeners and, and to the many people joining us today for the very first time. Uh, these free monthly webinars are brought to you by volunteers who all uh, are with Electric Vehicle Society. If you enjoy the webinar and you want to help the transition to electric mobility or, or simply want to connect with a knowledgeable and, and pretty passionate group of uh, EV owners to learn more about the technology, please consider joining the EV Society. Full membership is just $50 a year and it comes with fringe benefits. So let's dig in now to episode 36 of Canada Talks Electric Cars. As more Canadians make the switch to electric vehicles, concerns are growing about whether our electricity grid can handle the increasing demand. Will we experience power outages or blackouts with so many EVs trying to charge at the same time? Can our current energy production and infrastructure keep up with this growing demand for electricity? Today's guest takes us through the challenges and opportunities uh, of EV adoption for the grid and what can be done to ensure a smooth transition to a cleaner, electrified future. But before we do that, we're going to take a shot here at uh, launching a, a very short poll just to set the tone for the evening. So let's launch the poll so that everybody can hopefully see this. And we're going to ask uh, just three questions. The first one is what percentage of, of uh, Canadian electricity comes from renewable uh, sources? Let's see how the room uh, uh, does with coming up with the correct answer for that. So feel free to jump in and choose either 25%, 45%, greater than 65%, or greater than 85%. And away you go, you are answering. Second question, of course, is what do you think is the biggest challenge to deploying vehicle to grid at scale? Uh, I'll warn you that there are probably more than one correct answer, but the question is what do you think is the biggest challenge to deploying uh, vehicle uh, to grid at scale? And then finally, uh, what is the primary benefit of using EVs to support the electricity grid? I think we're going to stop it there where we made it to 83 percent people are still uh, coming at it but um, hopefully we've got the bulk of the room responding so i'm going to share the results and read them out quickly for those watching on the recording question one what percentage of uh, canadian electricity comes from renewable resources this is the only one with a correct answer um, uh, 27 percent said greater than 25 30 percent said greater than 45 percent a third of the room thought it was greater than 65 and 13 percent said greater than 85 percent of our electricity comes from renewable resources well the correct answer according to the latest numbers we could find is just over 65 percent of uh, electricity comes from renewable sources so that's that's a about a third of the room got that correct uh, next question, what do you think is the biggest challenge to deploying vehicle uh, to grid at scale? And again, lots of right answers here. And uh, I guess it's not surprising that the room is almost evenly split. Uh, there aren't enough cars to really make this uh, make bi-directional uh, take place at scale. Uh, there, are, there is an issue with a lack of, a lack of standardized protocols and technologies for communication. And there is a, obviously a cost to upgrade the infrastructure to be able to do this. And then finally, uh, it's probably quite true that a lot of consumers are simply unaware at this point of the technology. Some of them don't know about electric cars, if you can believe it. And finally, what is the primary benefit of using EVs to support the electricity grid? And uh, this is not so evenly split. Uh, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, 37% uh, of the room believe that that is the primary benefit. Uh, over half, just over half of the room think that increased re reliability of the grid is the biggest benefit. Uh, just under 10% said lower electricity rates for consumers and 1% said increased revenue for utility companies. So there you have it. Uh, kind of interesting that this, to hear your views and see it. We appreciate uh, very much you participating in that. Uh, I'm sure that uh, our guest tonight will shed some light on on exactly those issues uh, through his presentation. 
And to that end, uh, I'm really happy to introduce our speaker. Matthew Sachs is uh, uh, Chief Operating Officer uh, of Peak Power, an energy storage services provider, is focused on delivering innovative solutions to offset uh, the most expensive hours of electrical demand uh, uh, for utilities and building owners. So uh, not only is it uh, amount of electricity that we use that's very costly, it's also those demand charges, those peak demand charges and, and uh, uh, peak powers technology helps uh, skate around that. Peak has developed an industry leading software platform that uses machine learning to optimize the operation of behind the meter energy storage systems and other distributed energy resources, including of course, all the batteries in our electric cars. Peak Power's Peak Drive project is one of North America's largest demonstrations of the commercial applications of vehicle to grid technology. So with that, Matthew, welcome uh, to the webinar. Really, really uh, pleased uh, that you've taken time out to come and join us tonight. Yeah, thank you so much, Tim. I'm really uh, happy to be here. Well, I'm going to get out of your way and uh, let you share your screen and uh, have at it. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, folks, give me just one second to get this all started. Uh, so as Tim mentioned, uh, my name is Matthew Sachs. Uh, I'm uh, the COO of Peak Power and one of the uh, co-founders. Um, today, I'm gonna be talking about uh, electric vehicles and vehicle to grid and the impacts of the growth of EVs on the grid um, and the potential for um, really transforming the electricity sector by rethinking what it, uh, an electric vehicle electric vehicle can be used for. First, a, a little bit about peak power and I'll kind of try and um, frame the problem. Uh, we are a Canadian clean tech company. We develop solutions to help manage distributed energy resources. Uh, we've had a number of global first technology demonstrations that we've been really proud of. Uh, it's gotten us featured in Forbes, Bloomberg, Globe and Mail, uh, and we've received some really positive industry recognition, uh, including being named as the Ontario Energy Agency's uh, Company of the Year in 2021, uh, and some other um, awards, as you can see on the board here. Uh, we have an incredible team that pulls this together, uh, and our partners include some of the biggest names in utility, mobility, real estate, and finance. So um, I'll try and explain a bit about what um, Peak Power actually does and the tools that we develop. Um, we like to think of it as a, we call it a multi-asset, multi-objective platform. So by multi-asset, what we mean is we can control batteries, we can control buildings, and we can control electric vehicles. What's the similarity between all of those different devices? They're all types of distributed energy resources. That is assets that are used that consume a significant amount of energy, but also where you can manipulate them specifically to respond to um, uh, impacts on the grid. So with batteries, you can charge them and discharge them. With buildings, you can change the temperature set point. You can turn off lights, turn off fans. If you're familiar with utility demand response programs, this can be done pretty often. And we think electric vehicles are gonna be the most ubiquitous uh, DER, distributed energy resource on the grid. And the combined capacity of all of these uh, batteries in the vehicles, it's gonna rival nuclear plants and natural gas plants. So what if you could aggregate these different types of systems and have them perform like a virtual power plant? The concept of a virtual power plant is that from the perspective of the grid, it's all about balancing supply and demand. So the grid doesn't really care if you are generating more kilowatt hours uh, from a nuclear site or reducing consumption by conservation efforts or discharging a battery, whether it's in a vehicle um, or in a building. Uh, by multi-objective, what we mean is we look at economic benefits, but also environmental benefits and grid benefits, which can be resiliency or reducing the impact of blackouts. We have a pretty ambitious goal, and that's to make power plants obsolete. It might seem like hyperbole, but if you really think about the expected growth of electric vehicles, that might actually give us the means to make this a reality. And later in the presentation, I'm actually going to um, show some numbers, illustrative examples of how the capacity in electric vehicles actually compares to Ontario's natural gas fleet. So let's understand where we're at today. 
there really is a transformation happening in the electricity sector. We are moving from a centralized to a decentralized model. So this is happening for a number of reasons, in part because of an increased awareness of environmental issues. We're reducing the use of fossil fuels. There are advances in software that can be um, both looking at uh, the decreasing cost of solar and wind and battery technologies, but also the advanced computing power to be able to forecast uh, um, things that are happening on the grid and to be able to send these uh, telemetry signals to different types of assets. And finally, there are changes in electricity market rules. Many electricity markets around the world are changing their market rules to accommodate these distributed energy resources. The most notable um, example of this is in the US. It's called FERC Order 2222. This is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission Mandate 2222. This was passed a couple of years ago and it is mandating every state and every system operator in the US to change their energy market rules to allow buildings, batteries, and electric vehicles to participate in wholesale energy markets that otherwise were previously uh, you had to be a natural gas plant or a nuclear plant or other some other type of large generator to participate. So all these trends together are creating the context where we can move to a decentralized energy grid. So analysts expect there's going to be 20 million EVs on the road by 2030. And you can see these different predictions. And, you know, is this the right number, the wrong number? I don't really know. If you look at the uh, increase in fuel prices, this is a little bit dated, but at the start of, of the, the, um, the war in Ukraine, when, when there was this big spike in fuel costs, uh, you could see the Google trends. There was an associated spike in people searching for electric vehicles. So as fuel costs rise, the interest in EVs grows. So I'd say that, you know, um, that, target of 20 million EVs in the US by 2030 is probably probably pretty realistic. In Ontario, they're expecting um, 1 million EVs by 2030, uh, which is what the IESO and others are using for their planning purposes. So what does that mean for the grid? So not surprising, the increase in electric vehicles is going to cause an increase in demand. And I want to be really clear here, um, when we talk about energy, the differences between uh, energy use in kilowatt hours and energy demand in kilowatts. And I like to explain this with a metaphor. So the problem facing the grid, every grid, everywhere around the world, is that everyone wants to use energy at the same time. And because of that, the utilities have to size all of their infrastructure. Every generator, every pole, every wire, every transformer is sized for these peak hours on the grid, even though it might only occur for a couple of hours a year. And they even have to oversize it by 15%. So back to the metaphor, imagine if highways were built the same way. Imagine if highways were built with 20 lanes in either direction, specifically to manage Thanksgiving rush hour traffic. But the rest of the time, they were relatively empty. That is what our grid looks like, but we don't see it because it's generally invisible to us. But the grid has an asset utilization factor of less than 20%. That means 80% of the time, the grid is over-designed and over-built. In urban areas, it's even worse. Our um, our asset utilization factor in urban areas is about 10%. So imagine, um, uh, again, this metaphor, what if you, you manage the city and you built a highway in the 1950s to accommodate traffic and over the last decades, it was always packed in Toronto, the gardeners always packed. And what if it was really expensive to build more lanes? What if it cost a billion dollars to build more lanes? What if you found out that you could pay people to work from home and not use the highways? What if it was cheaper to pay people to work from home than it was to build more lanes? This is the general concept behind a lot of um, interesting phenomenon that happens in the electricity space, but I'm gonna focus on demand response programs and other demand uh, utility programs 
where they incentivize people to not use energy during these peak moments. So it could be in a demand response program, they pay people to not use energy. Imagine any person selling any commodity that actually pays you to not buy their commodity. It's an absurd thing, but it happens in the energy sector because of this problem with peak demand. So if you think about this problem that's facing the grid and the costs associated with oversizing the grid, now you can imagine how EVs are going to exacerbate it. It's not that we can't handle the kilowatt hours to fill the engines. It's that everyone wants to charge at the same time. So imagine all these people coming home from work, they're stuck in rush hour, and then they get home and they all plug in at the same time. That increase in demand is going to have a really big impact on the grid. Uh, sorry, before I move on, this has actually been um, quantified to some degree. In the US, a uh, consulting company that studies um, electricity issues called the Brattle Group, they estimated that it would cost between 75 to $125 billion to upgrade the grid to manage those 20 million EVs expected by 2030. Utilities don't have this money sitting in their pockets. They, they haven't planned for this. So it has to come from ratepayers if they're expected to increase their infrastructure for these moments of peak demand. I would say there are better solutions available. So I'm going to outline four different strategies that all help manage this growth in demand. The first is what status quo, increasing grid infrastructure. And by the way, it doesn't help. And I don't know if there are some utility folks on the call. I'm going to assume there are. But it doesn't help that the way that the utilities are regulated, they can really only make profit by increasing their infrastructure and increasing their costs. So this is status quo, but it's built into the regulatory framework that if a utility wants to make more money, they're incentivized to grow. So we need to fight that natural incentive that utilities have. Another mechanism that we can use is enhanced time of use rates. So there are some very simple um, uh, EV rate programs and smart chargers that can be really uh, chargers that can be really a cost-effective way um, to to reduce these demand costs. In, in California, simple EV uh, specific rates uh, saved dis uh, distribution customers more than five hundred million dollars just by shifting load profiles. And in Ontario, um, just last year, the OEB pr proposed an optional enhanced time of use rate with a 10x difference between peak times and uh, low overnight times. So in this scenario, you would set a timer on your charger to only charge during the uh, low peak periods. Another um, strategy is co-locating battery energy storage with EV chargers. This, uh, the batteries could discharge when you're charging. This is specifically important for um, DC fast chargers, highway charging, when you really don't have an option to not charge. You need to charge as quick as possible. Uh, a lot of fleet um, uh, business opportunities will look into this. So this will be a way to manage the demand um, while still allowing fast charging. And the fourth strategy, the one that I'm going to spend the most time on today, is looking at vehicle-to-grid integration. So these are allowing EVs to provide grid services using bi-directional chargers connected to homes, businesses, or, or microgrids. And you can not just um, uh, manage the increase, but actually reduce moments of peak demand by discharging during those key moments. And you can get a lot of other ancillary backup, uh, sorry, uh, benefits, um, such as uh, backup power at very low cost. So imagine uh, the Ford F-150 advertises that you can use that vehicle to back up uh, a home for between three to five days. So imagine that during emergencies, if everyone has electric vehicles, they can power their homes, or they can use electric school buses to power community centers and then provide that relief. And then when you start to run low on your charge, drive to the nearest region that has power, refuel, come back and do it again. So from a health and safety perspective, there's a lot of real benefits to thinking of electric vehicles as mobile generating stations. So. Now we'll talk about some of the benefits of vehicle to grid. So um, again, the concept is you're sending electricity in two-way flows. You're not just charging the battery, you're also sending it back to the grid. Vehicle to grid has been shown to be able to manage grid capacity issues 
at 10 times less cost than stationary storage. Peak Power, my company, is in the stationary storage business. 90% of our revenues are putting batteries in buildings. And what I'm saying is, if vehicle to grid comes to pass, that may become obsolete because you're going to have your vehicles there anyways, and it's going to have batteries anyways. And so you can reduce that huge capex of permitting and installing a large um, stationary battery and turn it into an OPEX, paying drivers to, uh, to use their batteries while those vehicles are parked. There are new business models that are emerging. A lot of it is experimental right now, but um, there are different ways to incentivize drivers to allow uh, their vehicles to be used for vehicle to grid. And studies show that 40% of EV drivers are willing to participate. Um, and in fact, there were studies looking at car sharing and it found that over 50% of users of car sharing programs uh, would prefer to participate if they knew that their vehicle was being used for vehicle to grid. I'm gonna get into the economics of it later, but when you ask the question, would someone be willing to let their vehicle be used for vehicle to grid? You really can't answer it without saying, well, how much are you gonna pay them? And how often are you gonna call on it? If you're gonna expect to call on it every day and get you know, pennies a day, no, people won't allow that. But in our models, you can get paid thousands of dollars a year for five hours of operation. Now that's five hours of specific operation on the grid. We need to forecast that. Maybe it takes us um, 20, maybe even 40 hours to capture those five peak moments. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later. But again, if you could get paid thousands of dollars to allow your vehicle to be used for vehicle to grid a few days of the year, that's really compelling. And all of a sudden, those issues of degradation and, and worry about um, you know, whether you want to use the vehicle or not kind of go away. I know a lot of people that would you know, make more from allowing their vehicle to participate in grid services than they're getting paid in their job, right? So you really have to consider versus what when you talk about would people be interested in participating in vehicle to grid and how much will they get paid for it. So let's now get into a specific example using Ontario. The chart on the left is looking at Ontario's capacity shortfall expected in the coming years. So you can see today on the left-hand side, we don't have a problem. We have enough capacity to meet demand. But by 2030, you, have to, you start to see a pretty significant uh, capacity shortfall of around 3.5 gigawatts, okay? Now on the right, let's look at um, what 1 million electric vehicles in Ontario by 2030 will look like. Well, 1 million electric vehicles with very conservative estimates of throughput and availability would be about 24 gigawatts. So multiples of our capacity so now, again, I'm not saying that all of these vehicles will be used for this. Obviously, only a small fraction will participate in any given moment. But I'm trying to do some back of the envelope examples to show that the capacity is enough just from electric vehicles. We don't have to build another natural gas plant if you can create the right incentives to, um, to pay drivers to use their vehicles. But let's go further. If we look at Ontario's total peak demand year over year, it's about between 20 to 25 gigawatts. And it varies a little bit, you know, um, depending on the weather, the temperature and all of this. But what if we go further? So we know that 1 million electric vehicles have a, a combined capacity of 24 gigawatts, maybe more, maybe less. I'm not even including um, fast chargers or fast discharging. This is using estimates of, uh, I think, about 15 uh, kilowatt throughput. But what about if you forecast even further out? It's estimated that, uh, well, well, Ontario currently has 9 million vehicles. But what if 6 million uh, of those vehicles on the road were electric vehicles? That would have a combined capacity of 132 gigawatts. Again, dwarfing, dwarfing Ontario's peak capacity of 25 gigawatts. So again, going back to the question, will EVs break the grid or transform the grid? Imagine if even a fraction of these EVs, let's say 10%, wanted to charge at the same time 
at 6 p.m. when they got home from work. That would be 13 gigawatts adding to our current peak load of 24 gigawatts, basically 50% higher. Where is that capacity going to come from? Under the status quo, that would come from new natural gas peaker plants. But if you flip the model and say, let's use bidirectionality, let's use vehicle to grids, let's use these to give energy back, uh, then all of a sudden you have this huge pool of capacity that can be used to, um, if not eliminate these peaks, at least eliminate the natural gas, use, the polluting elements. Of the 20 to 24 gigawatts of peak demand, roughly eight gigawatts comes from natural gas. So all you really need to do to eliminate natural gas use in Ontario for peaker plants, again, for peaking moments during these moments of peak demand, I'm not saying for kilowatt hours, those are, that's a kind of a different issue. But if you wanted to eliminate the need to use natural gas uh, peaker plants, you would only need a very small fraction of the available capacity of EVs on the road in the future. And it's important to understand that vehicle to grid creates this virtual cycle because we're talking fundamentally about new revenue streams for EV drivers. And if you have a new revenue stream, that's better than a subsidy. I mean, certainly less uh, politically um, fragile. And a, a new revenue stream will lower your cost of ownership. And if you have a lower cost of ownership, that accelerates the switch from gas to electric vehicles. And the more electric vehicles on the road, the more capacity there is to provide these services. And the more services provided, the more revenue there is. So again, this is a very um, elegant way to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles while also solving uh, a major environmental problem and a major grid problem. So it kills, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's a great metaphor, killing birds with stones, but you can, um, you can solve a lot of problems in a very elegant way through vehicle to grid technology. I like to think of vehicle to grid as a component of a larger trend that's happening with the vehicle OEMs. When you go to um, uh, vehicle OEM you know, conferences, they talk about a transition from transportation 1.0 to 2.0. Transportation 1.0 is characterized by you know, polluting internal combustion engines, um, personal use passenger vehicles. And you know, after you sell the vehicle, you really don't want to talk to your purchaser anymore. If they contact you, it's because there's a problem and it's a warranty issue. In transportation 2.0, you've got clean electric vehicles, you have new mobility models, you've got connected devices, and most importantly, every sale creates a new opportunity for an ongoing interaction with the customer over the life of the vehicle. So this can be done through um, you know, dashboard telemetry, your vehicle telling you, you know, if there's enough air in your tires or when to get your fuel checkup. But vehicle to grid is an amazing opportunity for the OEMs to have ongoing conversations with their customers. Uh, my introductory slide had the um, hopefully tempting uh, title, free fuel for life. Imagine an OEM saying, hey, once you buy my vehicle or the vehicle for me, you never have to worry about the cost of fuel again. You will get free fuel for life if you let us manage your charging and discharging. We'll make sure you always have enough charge in the vehicle. And when you're not using the vehicle, we'll manage your battery to support these grid services by, by acting as a virtual power plant on your behalf. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but it just felt like it was a, a, a useful thing to show. When I talk about grid services, there are multiple different services that these batteries can provide. And they come in at different you know, durations and there's vehicle to building, vehicle to grid. Um, so we don't need to get into it, but just to say there are many different types of grid services that, um, that electric vehicles can support. And this is the slide that everyone cares about. Let's talk about the money. We have found in our own pilot projects that one vehicle can earn about $6,000 USD per year per vehicle. This is a little bit of a unique case. We're taking advantage of a Ontario specific program that may not be scalable for a full V2G rollout. So it's proof of concept. But I do think that um, uh, it's very realistic to be able to get about $3,000 per year per vehicle 
fairly easily. Again, we're getting 6,000 today. And what I'm saying is uh, our particular program is, uh, is maybe a bit aggressive and that a more rational or, or conservative approach would estimate about $3,000 per year per vehicle. And this lines up with industry estimates uh, prepared from the Department of Energy in the US that in general across the US, across North America, you can get around $3,000 USD uh, per vehicle per year. And then I have an example of how this might be split. There would be a software fee, an aggregation fee to access energy markets. The driver would get a share and the vehicle OEM might get a share. These numbers are purely speculative. This is not a contract that I have with anybody. It is an illustration to show how OEMs could benefit. Maybe the driver should get more. Maybe the OEM should get less. Maybe the aggregation fee might be a little higher. doesn't really matter. I'm trying to show notionally that with $3,000 per year, in this example is $2,500 per year, there is uh, plenty to share between all of the stakeholders to make sure that everyone is properly incentivized to work together. There's been a lot of traction in vehicle to grid. I go to a lot of energy conferences. I'm uh, amazed. You know, three years ago, no one really talked about it. Now, uh, there's usually at least one panel, if not more, at every conference. There have been uh, a lot of automakers announcing uh, their forays into uh, bi-directional vehicles. Nissan has been a leader. Ford F-150 is bi-directional. GM Energy is taking the biggest leap. I, actually, I should be specific. General Motors has created a new company called GM Energy specifically to capitalize on V to G trends. They want all of their electric vehicles to be bi-directional by 2025, and they are going to become a virtual power plant managing uh, those electric vehicles. I won't go into all of these, but just to say across North America, there are a lot more examples and growing examples of V to G being commercialized. One of the biggest examples is in California. They recently announced three separate V to X uh, projects. Quick comment on nomenclature. I've been using vehicle to grid V to G. I use that term loosely. There's actually vehicle to building V to B, vehicle to home V to H, or V to X, which is kind of the v vehicle to anything, V to M, vehicle to microgrid. So when I use V to G, I don't literally mean exporting energy from the battery to the grid. In most cases, you're exporting from the battery to a home or to a business or to a building. I'm just using the terms a little bit loosely. And we'll end the presentation with uh, some practical examples from our own experience. This photo on the left is a real photo of a fleet of 10 Nissan Leafs connected to bi-directional chargers. We have two of these demonstrations in downtown Toronto. Um, here we're saying 21 vehicles in three buildings. Actually, there's two participant buildings and one is kind of R&D. But we have been able to prove oh, with years of experience now that we can get about $6,000 USD per vehicle per year. We uh, uh, recently announced, but not started, a vehicle to home pilot with Hydro One as a partner. This project has received some funding from the IESO. And in this project, we're looking at using the vehicles to provide backup power to homes, as well as providing these grid services. So again, I think it's a really strong value proposition that you're not just buying a vehicle, you're also buying the safety and security of a backup power system um, and a revenue generating asset. This is the final slide. And uh, I like it because it helps pull together all these concepts. When I started talking about what peak power does, I use that kind of a loaded term of a multi-asset virtual power plant. So this is an example of how that works in practice. Peak Power has done this dozens of times now, uh, but uh, these are showing eight different buildings in downtown Toronto. Four of these buildings have behind the meter batteries. Two of the buildings have electric vehicles, those 20 Nissan Leafs that I mentioned. So 10 in one building, 10 in another. And two of the buildings have manual load curtailment, where we send a notice to the building operator and they change the temperature th th uh, threshold. And we've been able to show that based off of a, either our forecast or utility signal, we can orchestrate all of those assets to act together as a virtual power plant. In this case, we created a consistent one megawatt load reduction over four hour period and earned $10,000 in four hours. 
by operating this virtual power plant. And again, what this virtual power plant really did was it eliminated an equivalent requirement from a natural gas peaker plant. So as much as we can discharge with these batteries and, uh, and electric vehicles, all of that is literally reducing the requirement for polluting natural gas peaker plants. So that's the end of my presentation and hopefully we have uh, enough time to get into some questions. Awesome, awesome, great job. Where do I sign up? <laughs> Uh, no, more, I think well, probably, uh, one, of, one of the main questions is going to be, when can I sign up, I guess, is the real question. Yeah, you know, I try and be really balanced when I talk about vehicle to grid. I'm obviously passionate and excited about it. I think there's huge potential. But I recognize also there are some very real barriers that need to be overcome. The biggest, in my opinion, the question was asked earlier. This is my opinion. But standardization is a real issue. You know, you have um, companies like Tesla trying to kind of go it alone, creating their own uh, approaches that don't communicate with other systems. That's not really going to work if you want to have any business model that works at scale, where you want people to have the flexibility to plug into different types of chargers. And these OEMs, they sell their vehicles around the world. They don't want to make one system for CAISO, another system for ISO New England, another system for the IESO. They want to sell the same vehicle across North America. So standardization is really important. But it, on the flip side, it, it is, of course, worthwhile to mention the technology works today. California is uh, the most progressive. You can buy an electric vehicle, sign up for that pilot program, and make money today in California uh, through vehicle to grid. We are doing it today in Ontario, but we're being a little bit cheeky about it. We have to do it at a commercial office building that has a special rate structure. So when will it happen? It's happening now. When will it happen at scale? I think that's going to take some real leadership. Uh, it's difficult for any specific utility or even regulator or system operator to have the scale to make a difference. But if you had federal or national leadership to make that direction, then it would be very easy because there are so many benefits for so many people. Utilities love it because you sell more kilowatt hours. Um, OEMs love it because they'll uh, sell more vehicles, create more stickiness with their customers, lower the cost of ownership. And of course, the system operators love it because it um, reduces infrastructure costs on the grid. And hopefully, consumers love it because it's an environmentally preferable way to uh, reduce emissions from the grid and from transportation at the same time. Yeah. Well, I, I particularly like the... Uh... The viewpoint that you could use as a, a manufacturer to say, buy my car and you get free fuel for life. That's that's pretty cool. It's just converting the dollars to a, a, a tangible thing. I'm going to bring Jason on. Jason, I know I see we got a bunch of questions here and I'm going to get out of the way again. And um, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking us through some of those questions. Thanks, Tim. And thanks, Matt. Yeah, we have a bunch of questions coming in, so I'll try to stay on top of them. You've touched on this first one already, but it's a two-parter, and I'll see if there's anything you want to expand on. Uh, you know, what's the level of interest from grid operators that you're seeing uh, regarding this? It sounds like it's high. Uh, I would say there is a tremendous amount of curiosity. Um, grid operators, and this is not a criticism, are naturally cautious. They need to be cautious. Their number one responsibility is reliability, more so even than cost and environmental concerns. They need to produce reliable power. And there are a lot of questions still about the reliability of vehicle to grid. How much of a price signal do you need to get someone to respond? How many vehicles will respond? Is there enough capacity out there? Um, so many system operators are funding pilot projects. The IESO has funded a number of different pilot projects uh, looking at vehicle to grid. And certainly we're seeing that in California where they're making the rate case to the regulator to be allowed to do these pilot programs. So I would say we're at the curiosity stage. I have not seen any serious proposals um, on how to incorporate vehicle to grid. It, we're at the pilot project stage where people are trying to learn about the implications of it. Great, thank you. And on a vehicle level, are vehicles that do V2L capable of this as well, or do they have to specifically be kind of V2G? Um, there are a number of different 
physical mechanisms for it and it also is changing when you talk about vehicle to, to l vehicle to load typically i think of a vehicle that has a plug in it and you can plug in you know if you're going camping uh, a fridge into your vehicle something like that that's vehicle to load that doesn't really allow for vehicle to grid because you know you can plug something into it sure you're getting power out of it but you're not getting the type of flow that you need to power a home or you know send energy back to the grid so um uh i would say it's a step in the right direction it's a neat feature uh but uh, it's a different functionality than true vehicle to grid functionality um the other nuance that i want to give there's a lot of debate in the industry uh, over whether the inverters that that um, that transform the power should be located on the vehicle or in the charger. Currently, the the approach that seems to be taking off is putting it in the charger. So you need a vehicle that is capable of bidirectional functionality, and you need a bidirectional charger. Today, it is impossible to buy a residential bidirectional charger. There's a chicken and egg situation. The technology exists. It's easy to do. You can make them. We looked into making them ourselves, um, but they're not UL certified. No one has gone through the manufacturing because of this chicken and egg. Today, you can't make money off of it. But as soon as there's this leadership saying, we want to change the regulations to allow it, it is a technically easy thing for manufacturers to include in their process. Okay, thank you. This one's uh, fairly specific. It says there's some power lines going in near uh, Atikoken with some opposition. Wouldn't installing local power such as solar and wind in the area make it unnecessary to do that sort of construction? So, so what this question is referring to is um, creating islands and microgrids, island and microgrids. And certainly the concept is very strong. You don't necessarily even need electric vehicles. With a big enough battery and wind power and solar, they can be sized correctly. Currently, it's still expensive, but so is building power lines. Um, so in certain northern communities, remote communities are doing these um, uh, islanded microgrids today. When you bring into V to G, it does change the economics, again, because you're you pay for the asset once and you pay for the asset because you want a vehicle for transportation. The grid services is a, almost a free benefit. There is one example that I've heard of, of an island. I think it's in Denmark or off of Denmark that is 100% renewable using vehicle to grid to uh, as the transport mechanism. So there is at least one case that I know of where this can be done. But if I'm putting my realistic hat on, you know, reliability is really the critical factor. And I don't know that this idea of a fully island microgrid with, with electric vehicles, I can't say that that's reliable. We don't have enough examples of it yet. Okay. Lots of questions regarding battery degradation. So I'm going to- I love this question. Let me, let me just talk about battery degradation. Everyone raises battery degradation as the number one concern. And they'd say, why would I- allow my you know $100,000 Tesla to be used in bidirectional mode, it's just going to degrade the battery. So there have been some studies on it. First study shows that um, discharging at 25 kilowatts, is, and that's quite a bit, uh, my examples before use 10 kilowatts, but discharging at 25 kilowatts is roughly equivalent to driving on the highway at 120 kilometers per hour. So yes, it degrades the battery, but not more than using the vehicle. There's another study, and actually quite a bit backing this up, and I see this in the comments, uh, so I, I was happy to see someone um, kind of making a similar statement. There are studies that show if you are very strategic in how you charge and discharge the battery, and you don't discharge it completely, and you don't charge it completely, you can actually maintain the battery life. It's like exercising it without stressing it. So most of the degradation occurs. There's a time-based element of degradation that happens whether you're using the battery or not. But the usage-based element of degradation occurs mainly in the margins when you're charging it completely and when you're discharging it completely. So if you are very strategic, and again, if you had the OEM managing it, for example, there are some studies indicating that you might even be able to increase the life of the battery by exercising this muscle and not entering those stress zones. So my overall, and then the third comment is, 
how much money are you going to get paid for it? What if it does degrade the battery? But if you get paid more than the cost of degradation, and if you can quantify that, imagine an app that said, we want to use your vehicle for two hours, we'll pay you $500, and the cost of degradation of your battery is going to be $2.50. At least you have the information to make an educated decision. So I'm not really worried about degradation. To me, it's a factor to be considered in a market-based decision. If you have hundreds of thousands of participants, all with access to the data of how much they can earn and what is the cost of participating, then they can make their own personal educated decisions on whether it's worth it for them. Some people might say, I only want to participate if I'm making more than 100 bucks an hour. Some people might say, I'll participate if I'm making five bucks an hour. That's a personal decision based off of their um, uh, ideas. Uh, last thing I'll say on it, we look at EVs today as a specialty vehicle because there's so few of them. And Tesla leading the pack being it's a luxury vehicle. But imagine a future where EVs are ubiquitous, where there are junker EVs, you know, people just drive EVs because that's normal. Then people are going to think a lot less of the incremental degradation of using it for vehicle to grid because they're commonplace. You just use it all the time. You don't think twice of, you know, an extra drive and, and um, the degradation that causes on your vehicle, even though every drive causes degradation because it's ubiquitous. So I think that all of those factors combined will, will make it that degradation is really not going to be a big detriment to, um, to vehicle to grid as a concept. And I think it'll be interesting. We don't have a lot of V to G capable vehicles right now, but it'll be interesting to see as they come out, whether OEMs put stipulations in their warranties around, around your usage. Well, so I'll, I'll admit those 20 vehicles that I showed earlier, we voided all the warranties. We had to buy those vehicles. Again, early stage pilot project. Uh, Nissan said, if we use Nissan certified chargers and keep the bidirectional charging below 10 kilowatts, they would maintain the warranty. Well, we didn't do that. We went to 25 kilowatt discharge and they weren't Nissan certified chargers. So that was a risk that we took on. But I will say, you know, Time is a funny thing. When we started the project, we would expected that these were R&D vehicles that would be, you know, throwaways at the end of the program. Because of the global supply chain issues and the interest in electric vehicles, we can sell these for almost as much as we bought them for, even with all the degradation from, from uh, vehicle to grid. People are, are, we've sold a number of the vehicles that have participated to um, participants in the program. And they don't mind that it was used for uh, bi-directional functionality. It still works perfectly. And um, uh, again, it's so hard to get an electric vehicle these days. At least it was a, a way for them to get access to an electric vehicle. That's awesome. Uh, regarding the provincial government, how, how do we pass these opportunities and ideas onto the provincial government to get action? Yeah. I've given this a lot of thought and it's challenging. It's not a simple thing because of the separation of powers, both in Canada and in the US, that you know, every province and every state has their own rules for how their grid is managed and how their electricity grid is managed. So the regulations happen at the state level. In Canada, we don't even really have a mechanism, at least in the US, they have the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which can kind of signal to the system operators that they want vehicle to grid to be allowed, like FERC 2222. So how do you get this message? The message that I like to put is that it's fundamentally more democratic. Why are regular homeowners and consumers forbidden from participating in electricity markets? How come only large generators and developers and IPPs and utilities can take advantage of this active daily energy market? The technology exists today, both from a hardware perspective and a software perspective, to allow hundreds of thousands, millions of new participants, homeowners, to participate. So I like that democratic message because it's inherently political. Every voter should be you know, concerned that they are not allowed to participate and make money from these energy markets. They're being kept out of it. So that's a kind of a frame that I think has a good political messaging that some political leader could make that part of their platform. 
Everyone complains about electricity costs. We're going to push for new regulatory structures that allows every homeowner to invest in solar, in batteries, in electric vehicles, and to become a participant and a revenue generator on this grid 2.0. That is a strong political message in my opinion, but I haven't seen anyone really take it up. Okay. Uh, regarding California, which you mentioned earlier, uh, are, they, are they a good test case for moving forward with standardization for OEMs and grid operators? My opinion is yes. Uh, I mean, they are way in the lead, not even by a little bit. They're, they're way in the lead on this um, uh, in terms of having a regulatory structure that allows electric vehicles to be aggregated and to participate. Now, I don't want to say that it's happening en masse. Uh, again, the largest pilot project there, which is not started yet, is for a thousand vehicles to give you a sense of scale. It's not going to be huge, huge, huge today, but they've got rules that allow it. No one else really does. So from that perspective, I think that they're showing a lot of leadership. Will they make mistakes? Absolutely. You know, but those lessons learned, I think, are, are going to be really valuable um, across North America. Okay. Someone's very interested in how much degradation did those leaves have after, after use? So, you know, one thing that we learned is the OEMs, at least Nissan, makes it very difficult to track that. What we found is the nameplate capacity is not the same as the usable capacity. And we have a theory that they oversize the batteries but don't tell you because they don't want you to notice degradation. Mm -hmm. So I actually can't quantify that. We haven't noticed any fundamental degradation since we've started the project, even with people driving the vehicles as well. So we haven't been able to quantify the degradation in part because of how the OEMs kind of um, hide that. They, they don't want people, you know, being so aware of degradation on the batteries. Right. But by itself, that's fairly encouraging. Exactly. Exactly. It says a lot on its own. Uh, I will say it is being studied by many different groups. The national labs in the US have you know, received funding from the Department of Energy to look into this. The OEMs are obviously very interested in this. Um, uh, we are working with the Department of Energy um, to uh, allow them to access our vehicles to see if they can come up with any findings that we haven't been able to, found, uh, to find ourselves. So um, I, I will say that we haven't noticed the degradation from participating in it. And a related question for your theoretical $3,000 a year earnings, roughly how many hours would you have to make your EV available per day? Yeah, it's a good question. It depends which revenue streams you're chasing. And that goes back to that regulatory structure question of what markets they allow you to participate in. So I'll use what we're doing today, and then I'll use another example as well. Today, we're doing what we call coincident peak reduction. But if you're in Ontario, it's the global adjustment mechanism. And it's structured around five hours of the year where all of Ontario is at its peak. They don't tell you when this occurs. No one knows when it occurs till the year is over. But our company creates a software that forecasts it. We predict that. Now, how do you know you've hit the peak? Well, the peak might change over the course of the year. And we use a two-hour window to hit that one-hour peak. Roughly over the course of the year, in our experience, it takes us less than 20 attempts to hit those five peaks. So that means on 20 days, you might get a call from peak power. And on each of those days, you might have to give up your vehicle for two hours. And then you might want to recharge it again afterwards because you don't want it empty. So call it three hours afterwards. So um, that amounts to, what, 40 hours per year, 20 days per year. Um, Another thing to remember is there are different business models. The way that I've been framing it and the way that people typically think about it is residential homeowners using it, which is great. That is a model. But there are other models. What about an Uber style model? Imagine a future with an Uber company, Lyft, whatever, maybe they're autonomous vehicles, doesn't matter. But these are vehicles that are bought to make money. They're not bought because you need to get to work in the morning. They're bought to make money. 
And imagine the Uber driver or the algorithm for the autonomous vehicle had a, a price surge mechanism, just like they do today, but it was getting a signal to tell it where it could make more money, either being a transportation asset, picking up people, or being a grid asset, plugging in. So from six in the morning to 10 in the morning, it's a transportation asset and it solves a transportation peak problem and it gets people to work. But then from two in the afternoon to six in the afternoon, all of a sudden it's a grid asset and it can make more money just finding a spot to park and plug in. I like that example because it changes the mindset of the trade-off. It's not necessarily, oh, I got to stay at work until 7 p.m. because my vehicle is being used for vehicle to grid. It's no, this is an asset that was designed to serve multiple purposes, depending on how it can make more money. And when you think of it that way, it kind of flips the script. Another good example, I'll go very quickly because I know we're running out of time, vehicle to grid school buses, a wonderful low hanging fruit because school buses are parked all summer. And that's when most of the peak events occur. So there is no trade-off. You've got something that's sitting in a parking lot and those batteries are big. Uh, we're not talking about 10 kilowatt throughput. We're talking about 300 kilowatt throughput. So imagine a bank of electric school buses that aren't being used in the summer that can be basically a portable power station uh, uh, based off of this forecasting and this technology. So again, think broadly about how this could be used and not specifically that how you personally would use it, but how it might be used in different business models and in different uh, contexts. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we're we're probably at that uh, witching hour and we should um, think about wrapping up. But Matthew, first of all, Jason, thanks very much, as always. I know it's uh, it's not that easy to sift through some of those questions. They jump around in Zoom. But you did a great job and and thank you matt that that was really very interesting very very helpful as i said i'm i'm ready to sign up uh, when that that opportunity comes along i also you know my imagination going wild and thinking about how uh, lower and lower battery costs are going to impact this whole thing that the point of payback uh you know comes much sooner and i, I just the future looks really good uh, for uh, EV drivers, um, not just because of the cars they have on the road, but because of the cars they have perhaps in their in their driveway or in their garage. So you, you've helped uh, put a lens over that. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Tim. Yeah. Well, uh, on that note, I will. Uh, I'll thank you very much, and I'm going to just mention that um, I think perhaps we've uh, hopefully eased concerns about EV charging and and what that might mean for the grid. Actually, made us a little uh, optimistic about what that me might mean for the grid. Um, so we will look at some very important and perhaps essential aspects now of building out a, a really good DC fast charging network in Canada. That's going to be our, our focus uh, next month. And we have uh, joining us for that presentation is um, uh, all the way from Calgary is Scott Sharabura, who's vice president of charging at Parkland. So they've, uh, they've been busy building out uh, DC fast charging and we'll uh, we'll hear all about that and and what the challenges and what the opportunities are for that uh, going forward so remember to mark the date that will happen on Tuesday June 6 always 730 Eastern Standard Time. So on behalf of uh, the entire webinar team that does this at EV Society, I really, really want to thank you all for joining us on the episode and for your uh, continued support of our monthly webinar. We do it because you come and uh, we'll keep doing it so long as you keep coming and, and uh, we do appreciate it. So from all of us at uh, Electric Vehicle so Society and until next time, uh, stay well. This will conclude today's webinar. Thank you.